fasten your seatbelt. We're flooring it again. We are NBC Sports Radio. All right, thanks for hanging with us, Kate Delaney, NBC Sports Radio, NBCSportsRadio.com. Dr. Philip Stieg joins us. Not only you'll see him at home games on the Giants' sideline, but he's a world-renowned neurosurgeon, chairman and founder of Wild Cornell fabulous facility in uh, New York. Dr. Stieg, thanks for joining us on the weekend when, I don't know, maybe you're a big tennis player. You could be playing tennis right now. Unfortunately, I've been working all day. But it's always <laughs> a pleasure to be with you, Kate. <laughs> I love that. All right, so I thought yeah. it'd be interesting to talk about this. You know, you and I have talked about concussions and athletes and all that kind of stuff in the past. But people listening to us, the the regular folks and, and others, but and athletic people who have concussions, there's another part to this whole concussion thing. There's a lot of discussion, and you and I have talked about it, about the physical effects of concussions. But what else can result from a traumatic brain injury that a lot of people don't realize. I think one of the things we've talked about in the past has been the, the, the emotional aspect of it. You know, the, the symptoms of a prolonged concussion include headache, the sleep variations, mood variations like depression. Many patients complain about light sensitivity called photophobia, sensitivity to noise called hyperacusis. They have changes in appetite, changes in their uh, concentration, attention, and memory, uh, difficulty with reading or looking at a computer or even watching TV, and they can have difficulty with their uh, emotional state and uh, 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 mood affects. So it's, it, it's varied, and depending upon how long those symptoms can persist, they can have confounding effects on their overall emotional status. Yeah, so, I mean, so that's a, a great question about... When you talk about mood effect, boy, that and, and all the possibilities of that, how do you treat that, Dr. Steve? It's, 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 it's difficult sometimes the, uh, you know, when the patient comes in is there for concussion patients, and we actually see this in other disorders as well, but when they come in with a concussion, they're seen at the concussion center at Wild Cornell, uh, they'll be seen by our neurologists who will give them a, a thorough examination and make sure that there isn't something organic. <clears throat> some some athletes and and individuals that have a concussion may have had a pre-existing disorder. They have, may have had attention deficit disorder. Or they may have had a depression or a mood or affective disorder. In which case, uh, those individuals frequently have will have prolonged symptoms of their concussion. Uh, but that being said, we still have to treat their pre-existing uh, disorder. If some of them are having problems with concentration, we will put them through a formal neuropsychological test, which is a two-hour battery of testing. And then hopefully we can find something that will be treatable with what's called cognitive remediation, where our neuropsychologists work with them, give them tricks and cues on how they can learn to focus, and once they get that focus back, their, their affective disorder can improve. And finally, if that fails, uh, we can send them to neuropsychopharmacologists. It's a fancy word for a, a, a mm-hmm. very well-trained psychiatrist who really understands the medications and the chemistry of the brain, and they can use certain drugs like Ritalin for concentration or Another drug is called Provigil, which is uh, important in treating mood and affective disorders. Yeah, so it's interesting in talking about that. If you, so if we look at it from that perspective of, of what could be, could, can you give us an example of where emotional or psychological symptoms disguise themselves as physical, though? Well, um, there are examples, uh, there are two types of things. There are people that have concussions and uh, the disorder or the, 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 the diagnosis is called somatization, where they, you know, they had a mild concussion, their MRI, their CAT scan is normal, their physical exam is normal, but they still complain about a number of these symptoms. And it creates an anxiety. Uh, 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 The symptoms create this anxiety. And then it converts, they convert this anxiety into a 
a bodily symptom. And with those, we just have to, it's really time, and we reassure them and work with them. Many of the patients with head trauma will complain about neck pain, and it turns out that they've actually strained their neck musculature, so we refer them to either physiatrists or highly qualified chiropractors that are expert in deep tissue massage, and we can make them better. Another form of reaction is called a conversion disorder, where a a, a patient will actually present with what looks like a neurologic problem, but they don't really have it. We can't confirm it with anything. And with those, there isn't, unfortunately, a drug. It's just time and emotional support, and it will usually resolve. Wow. So that means you really have to have a specialized team, right? Reviewing traumatic brain injury based on everything you've just told us versus a regular group of doctors? Absolutely. Yeah. What, what, what we've organized at, at, at Wild Cornell is the concussion center. And as I said, it's made up of neurosurgeons, neurologists, uh, neuropsychologists that uh, diagnose and treat. Then there's neuroradiologists that are experts in diagnosing any imaging changes and the neuropsychopharmacologists. And we all work together, do research together and treat patients together. Yeah, are you seeing a lot of, because you and I have talked about this before, I call them weekend warriors. I I joked you in the beginning about playing (laughs) tennis and you were working, and, you know, somebody just hits their head and they don't realize. I mean, how do you know if you've, I think it can be tricky where you have no clue you're walking around with a concussion. Well, I mean, it's good if you don't have a clue because then you're not really having any symptoms. It's more the, the, the person who just shrugs it off and has persistent headaches and neck aches, and then it can progress to, you know, real, uh, some kind of a symptomatology because mm. they've corrected for the, 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 the problem. For example, a person that has persistent headaches and, and the blow resulted in a flexion or extension of their neck, uh, uh, and they don't pay attention to it, and every, uh, then they go back to their weekend warrior activity, and they actually exacerbate or make worse the, the, the next strain that they've got. So by the time they come to us, they actually have something. Fortunately, as I said, that usually responds to deep tissue massage, heat, ultrasound. And if we have to, we can give them some gentle muscle relaxants. Yeah. So is that why it's important to develop a specific treatment plan for every person because everybody's different? I certainly think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the human, the human body, every, every patient presents with their own unique personality and their unique brain chemistry and their unique responses to all of these things. So you have to be thoughtful. The good news is with concussion is that 99% of them get better within seven days. It's the unusual ones that persist. And I find that one has to just be extremely positive with them, reassuring them uh, that it will get better. But we've all had a number of patients that take up to a year to get mm. over the impact of their concussion. Wow, so a year. So th- so that's not the norm, but it can happen. Absolutely. And now those are people that have had severe blows. You know, the, 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 the <laughs> I had one patient that you know, the helicopter crashed. And they were oh. fine, but they had a terrible concussion. Uh, you know, other other people with a, a bad fall off of a bicycle uh, with no, again, changes in the MRI scan and no physical findings, but they have all of those symptoms that I described in the top of the discussion. Uh, we have to work th- uh, through those with them, but it can take time. Well, a year. Dr. Philip Stieg, Wild Cornell, thank you so much. Kate, always a pleasure. Yeah, pleasure for me, too, as well. I had no idea. Boy, 99%, though, seven days, if you think about that, versus can you imagine the severe blows? So you think of professional athletes and then, like I say, the weekend warriors and what that can mean. And just the the average Joe, uh, so many of you listening to us, where you have a a weird spill, whether you're skiing uh, and you're doing some kind of activity like that, or you just take a weird fall. Like, I've seen that happen to people on ice. That's why... Ice can be so dangerous, and people joke about that, but when you have a bad fall on the ice and you smash your head and you don't realize, you think you feel okay, and and hopefully you go to the doctor, as Dr. Stieg said, because then what happens is those headaches. I had that happen to me, and it was a concussion, but uh, I was one of those 99% people, luckily, so it took seven days, and and, uh, that was it. All right, when we come back, we move on and dive into the story. 